before we get started, I want to turn it over to President of Monmouth University, Patrick Leahy, for a few words of welcome. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, thank you for helping to put this great event together and for moderating it. While we're in the company of our community, let me also thank you publicly for the incredible work that you do at the Monmouth University Polling Institute. There are 450, who knew there were 450 polling agencies of one kind or another, and only six had the Sterling A plus rating that Monmouth University has. So thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Let me join, uh, uh, Mr. Murray, and thank in welcoming all of you to this special event. This is an extended programming that we're doing around the visit of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who joined our community remotely uh, via Zoom, but nonetheless joined our community on September 21st. And uh, what an incredible event that was and the events that we're now hosting as part of that extended programming we bring today another uh, really significant speaker to Monmouth University. I want to just uh, introduce formally Senator Booker, if I may. The last time I had the great fortune of inter introducing Cory Booker, it was when he was mayor of Newark, and he had come up to a previous institution in Pennsylvania to deliver the Rosen Lecture in Law and Humanities. And uh, it was at that time I first got introduced to this uh, really extraordinary person. So I'd like to introduce him this way. He was, as he just pointed out, raised here in New Jersey, went to Stanford University out in California for, for college, where he was a member of the Cardinal football team. He was a tight end, one of the great versatile positions in all of football, don't you think, Senator? I think it's the greatest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a tight end. That's, I guess, what. <laughs> um, he completed his, oh, I should mention, too, if you don't mind, this last Sunday here in, on Monmouth University's campus, we hosted Stanford. Did you know that? No. The women's field hockey team came to West Long Branch oh, wow. last Sunday to play. And I'm happy to share, sad for you, to tell you that we won three to one. Oh. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. A anyway, um, so Cory Booker completed his bachelor's and master's degrees at Stanford. He was awarded the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship that allowed him to, to study at the University of Oxford in the UK. Completed that and came back here to the States to complete his law degree at Yale Law School. My point in sharing that with you is this individual could have done anything at that point in his life. And he chose to move to inner city Newark to become a community advocate, then a city council member, and then ultimately, of course, mayor of Newark. And his record as mayor of Newark is well uh, defined. There's a couple things though, at the risk of embarrassing uh, Senator Booker that I'd like to share in particular with you students. I don't know if you knew that Senator Booker, then Mayor Booker, or maybe it, was, maybe it was then Councilman Booker, went on a 10 day hunger strike to raise awareness around open air drug dealing and the related violence that ensued. I don't, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that it is well documented that he ran into a burning building to save one of his elderly constituents from what could have been a total disaster. I don't know if you know that after Superstorm Sandy, he took care of his constituents in so many ways, including some of his constituents who did not have a place to stay, invited them into his home. And I don't know if you knew that when he was a mayor of Newark, he took the SNAP challenge, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program of the federal government, that gives $30 to individuals to aid their ability to eat over a given week. He took that challenge to raise awareness around hunger in America. This is not your typical mayor, so it was no surprise in 2013 that he would be elected to the United States Senate and was serving the state of New Jersey ever since in that role. He is on the powerful Judiciary Committees, the Foreign Relations 
committee, the small business committee, among many others, and has become a bona fide national leader, bona fide national leader around some of the big issues of our day, criminal justice reform, ensuring that economic development reaches all of our citizens here in the country, and increasingly ensuring that access to quality health care is a right in America and not just a privilege. So for all of those reasons, for all of those reasons, I'm so proud to welcome to Monmouth University, U.S. Senator Cory Booker. Join me in welcoming Senator Booker. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, President Leahy, uh, for the introduction. Um, we were just talking outside. Um, we we're taking some pictures outside and talking about the, the only time I tried to take a selfie with uh, Senator Booker was two years ago in Iowa when I was tracking the presidential campaigns. Um, and this was at the Meskwaki Powwow, with the Meskwaki tribe, the, the Saxon Fox tribe of the Mississippi, which is a, a really unique story. Um, but I saw that he had an event there and it was out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Remember, you had to drive for a long time to get there. Um, but I think I used it more as an excuse to go to the powwow than to actually see you there at the powwow. And I actually ended up there, I think a couple hours before you, you even got there because I wanted to see the whole thing. And I, you know, I think about that because of, you know, you seemed in your element there. It's, a, it's another spiritual um, tradition that we were observing. And it's, you know, we think about that here today. I mean, we're sit, standing here or sitting here right now on land that the uh, Lenny Lenape, uh, had for, for, for many, 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 many centuries uh, had, had been their home. Uh, but you speak about our moral obligations a lot in, in, in public life. And when you do that, you draw on idioms from a wide range of spiritual traditions uh, in addition to your own Christian upbringing. Uh, so as you know, we, re we mentioned, we recently had the Dalai Lama speak here at Monmouth University and much of what you say about love and hope is similar to the themes that, that he was talking about. So why is this type of religious spiritual language in public life important to you personally? You know, my, you know, Gandhi used to always say, honor your incarnation. You know, I was born a black kid in America from a Christian tradition. And those long, hard streams of, of philosophy were very evident in my parents uh, and my grandparents, this idea of what our obligations are to each other. In fact, even more than that, this idea that we all belong to each other and that the calling of life is to, number one, make the most of yourself with the gifts God gave you. But the more important next step is to do everything you can on your short time here to love your neighbor. It's very much a part of my faith tradition. And as I got older, and, and especially when you get to college, you have to start living your own life and don't have your parents telling you what to do every day. I just kept getting a, a gift of mentor after mentor that evidenced for me that purposeful life, that it really is about not just loving another, but understanding the radicalness of that idea, that concept of love. And so my academic study when I was at a university setting really began to focus on American government and its foundations, which if you read our founding documents, you know, our Declaration of Independence and founding documents, they're full of the bigotries of the time. Native Americans are savages. Women aren't referred to as all. Blacks are fractions of human beings. But these imperfect geniuses leaned heavily on larger spiritual ideals. The end of the Declaration of Independence, if you read those words, they're, they're really powerful to me, and I hold them in my heart. They basically say, if this country is going to make it, if we're, if we're, this declaration is great, but if we're going to do it, we must mutually pledge you know, pledge to each other, our lives, our fortunes, and I love this word, our sacred honor. And, and so for me, I, I just think our, our, our civic space is a very sacred space. And we do have, no matter what faith tradition or even atheists, we do have a, a, a civic gospel of sorts that if we slow down and think about it, whether it's capitalism, 
which is an ideal put forth by a philosopher. Capitalism wasn't an end to itself. It was a higher calling as the best means with which to achieve a, a high state of community and well-being. D democracy with its roots in indigenous cultures here in the United States, India, uh, ancient Indian democracies, Greece, Europe, all of these were a larger moral mission about how we can organize ourselves. And I believe it's around that principle, that radical principle of love. So this was a key theme in your presidential campaign. Uh, and uh, I, I, I saw when you spoke to large and small crowds uh, that you really connected with people on this theme. And, you, and then you ended up getting the moniker of you know, Senator Love and all, yeah. all this from, from that. But it didn't resonate, at least if the results of the presidential primary are, are anything to go by. Uh, why do you think in this you know, day and age that, that that message didn't get you to the next, the next level in the presidential campaign? So, you know, I, I loved reading this sort of um, epitaphs, uh, the eulogies of my failed presidential campaign. And it was so affirming to my spirit, you know, when you see um, journalists who have a, a degree of objectivity. When I came back to the Senate floor and heard from Republican colleagues, even that were grateful for my message. And as one uh, journalist, I think she was from CNN, would say, going to our rallies was more like going to a revival where people came in maybe thinking that they wanted a message of, oh, let's beat up. In fact, one of my favorite moments in my presidential race was I was running for a, a stage platform in a rally and I'm about to jump up on the stage and a big guy was in Iowa looks at me and says, dude, I want you to punch Donald Trump in the face. <laughs> and I look at him and I go, dude, that's a felony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and I proceeded to get up and talk about the higher callings of our country when we are at our best. And so I, we, I may not have achieved the end that I thought we needed as a nation, but I feel like we made a lot of an impact in the message that we put out there. And if anything, it affirmed to me that I was... Um, that I'm in the right space for who I am. And the, the, you'll get this because you're really one of the more extraordinary uh, leaders in public uh, opinion and polling. Um, when me and you know the players, uh, mm -hmm. Matt Clapper and uh, Adisu Demese, my campaign manager and my second in charge of my campaign, then my chief of staff sat down. We, we looked at each other and had a moment of honesty. We said, you know, running for city councilman, mayor, those are meritocracies. You go out and can meet the voters, shake their hands, feel that connect, human connection. And people are gonna vote on you often, I think, degree of meritocracy. I think that our set run, I think New Jerseyans had a very clear understanding of who I was from eight years of work in Newark and they could see what they were getting. Running for president is almost where the, the it's not about a meritocracy, it's is the moment of the country meeting the message of the person. Um, and we sat there and said, we are not going to chase public opinion. We're running for a reason. And the reason we had was clear. And I love one reporter who told me once, you're of the 372 people running for president in the Democratic Party, you're one of the few that everybody knows why you're running. It was one of the best compliments they can give me. We were running because we feel the great threat to this nation. Um, uh, that old saying, if there's no enemy within, the enemy without can do you no harm. The greatest threat to our nation is our inability to find common ground, to recognize that the lines that divide us are nowhere near as strong as the ties that bind us. And, and we were running to put forth the, the larger virtues that have to tie us back together as a nation, or we will, we will begin to fade from global leadership. More importantly, we're already fading in some real significant ways that I believe are spiritual. We are more unhappy than most of our industrial peers. If you just use a lot of un, uh, objective suicide rates and depression, that, that we're losing our sense of community of com common purpose. And we almost have more animosity towards each other than we have towards the people outside of our country who, who mean us ill. We are a nation where our institutions now are, are, are feeding in an insidious way off of that hate. My, 
friend uh, Van Jones told me the story of being on a show called Crossfire. And I love what Brene Brown says. She says, it's hard to hate up close, so pull people in. And so he sits with Newt Gingrich and you know, we demonize each other from afar, but when you start talking, to, wait a minute, we agree on a lot of things. So they decided to have, told the producers, we wanna do a final segment called Ceasefire. And they uh, uh, started doing the segment, but the producers came in and stopped them because ratings are going down. You're everything about our lives now in terms of the corporate structures that touch us, traditional media, social media, which is now integrated all part of our life, they live off of our outrage and our hate. And so we are a society that is gonna to continue to be fractured. Um, and I think that is really insidious when we have a nation, again, go back to our founding principles or how we literally swear an oath to this flag to say those words, but we, we my purpose, if anything, is to be one of the chorus of conviction that helps to put more indivisible back into the one nation under God. Okay, well, that's actually a great segue to, we wanna get into the student questions here because I really want the students to have an opportunity. We have uh, four classes in here. Um, and uh, what you were just talking about, um, I think our first, uh, our first question is, is right on the money with this. This is, comes from a student in Professor Alaco's gender, race, and media class. And um, he's, a, he's the editor of our student newspaper. Wow. Right? So, and he has an offensive amount of hair. I mean, yes. look at that lush, yeah. those lush locks. I mean, why would you choose somebody like this to just make me feel so inadequate? So go ahead, Matt. I meant to cut it. I've been pushing it off. <laughs> what's your name? What's your first name again? Uh, my name is Matthew. Matthew. Nice yeah. to meet you, Matthew. Nice to meet you too. Do people call you Matt or are you one of those people? No, it's Matthew. Uh, people call me Matt, but when it comes to, you know, being printed or professionally, I go by Matthew. Okay. Just to, you know, right. it makes my parents happy. So. All right. <laughs> All right, Matthew, far away. Um, my question is, as a politician who is active on social media, do you feel as though you need to compete with other politicians in terms of engagement? Is there any pressure to over-sensationalize your posts in order to draw more attention towards your brand? That's a great, great question. And it's really uh, important now because my, my staff is gonna be having a retreat this weekend to talk about our social media platforms more in depth. I joke all the time, my, my staff is trying to pull me onto TikTok uh, um, uh, and uh, I have to work on sort of my moves if I'm going to do that. Um, look, I, do, I definitely look, I did a presentation in front of the Democratic Caucus looking at engagement and the platform and coaching my fellow Democrats on what they should be doing to get more engagement, get more followers and the like. And there are definitely things to do on your platforms to draw more followers. But the point of your question, I think, is, is really important to me. I do not want to do things just to get followers. I, I really make a distinction in my life between celebrity and significance, between popularity and purpose. I am very clear in my life purpose. Uh, I was reading my journal from 25 years ago uh, uh, when I was just coming out of law school and feeling really good because my life purpose hasn't changed. So if you go on my Instagram right now and look at my stories, I'm talking about spirituality. I'm talking about love. And I connect that to policy. Like, I don't think we could have deep community in America when as we sit here comfortably right now, there are millions of moms who are so economically insecure because you're almost 400 times more likely to plunge into poverty if you choose to have a child in America because we are at the bottom of the wealthiest nations in the world on child poverty, access to affordable, high quality childcare, paid family leave. We have the highest maternal mortality rates uh, uh, amongst developed nations, uh, uh, almost the highest amongst developed nations because we still don't have universal access to prenatal care. I mean, all of these things are a measure of how much we love our children. And they are directly related to policy. Every developed nation has paid family leave. Afghanistan and the Congo have paid family leave, but we don't in this nation. And it puts women, especially, under tremendous economic pressure, which by the way, affects their overall well-being, 
constantly having fear and cortisol. It, if the, the, a child in, in poverty, what that does to that child's brain development is stunning when you talk to folks who want to analyze this. So to me, this is a, relax, a, a, a reflection of the worst kind of poverty in a rich society, which is the poverty of empathy and the delusion that somehow we are disconnected to each other, that your child's suffering does not somehow impact my life, which is a lie. And so, so I, I, I have a purpose and I want to stay relevant with that on my social media and not pander, but try to continue to bring light uh, uh, and, and truth. And very importantly, my own vulnerability as a post I did on Instagram this weekend around the time of my father's death, about my, about my, it was the anniversary of my father's death on the 10th, and going through a parent with a dementia and Parkinson's, you know, I, 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 I'm a little embarrassed that often it takes us as human beings having to go through something ourselves in order to develop the empathy for other people going through things. And so I, I hope that all of us understand that we are powerful more than we know and look at social media, which are, is something that, God, if I think about the civil rights organizers of my parents' generation, if they had social media, and the, and the, the less academic example I'll give you of this is um, there's a professor at Stanford who literally measured that if you go out right now, as you walk out, and one of you sees a piece of trash on the ground and just picks it up and puts it in the trash can, she was able to measure that acts of kindness witnessed by others, she was able to measure that it affects people three degrees of separation. Now, I know it affects people far greater than that. Simple acts of kindness. And I ask students all the time, I ask people all the time, please do an audit Knowing how influential you are, do an audit of your own social media. Is it full of trivialities? Is it full of snark and cynicism? Or do you recognize that if you're using those platforms to be light workers, to encourage, to, have, to show your own vulnerability, that you can make change multiple degrees of separation in ways that you can't even fathom, my friend knows this because it was the central story of my whole presidential campaign was that, that power of influence. Because I am sitting here right now before you because of media. There was a, a white guy in 1965 here in New Jersey sitting on his couch on, 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 an, on I think it was a Sunday, watching the, the media of that time, TV, and, and his show, he was watching a show called Judgment at Nuremberg about the aftermath of the Holocaust. It was a movie most Americans were watching because back then we had three channels. And he's stunned that suddenly he's watching a scene from Alabama on a bridge called the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he sees these incredible marchers get beaten viciously by the Alabama state troopers. And Immediately, his empathy expands, and he decides he's going to go to Alabama, then realizes he can't afford a plane ticket, but then he does something. He does an act of love. He realizes he could spend an hour a week maybe doing pro bono work. He's a lawyer. He, only an hour a week, and he calls this woman named Lee Porter, still living today, an amazing leader in our state, and she, she says, I could use your help, and they go put together a scheme basically to attack racism in this state. And, and to help families who are being denied, black families being denied housing in white communities. And they, they, they went years past, they started getting good at this about exposing housing discrimination. He says, I get a case file with a family's name on it and we help them get into a house, big ruse. They get a white family that poses them, whole thing, big legal work, get this family into the house. And he goes, you know the name on that case file? I go, no. Well, the names on that case file were Carrie and Carolyn Booker, my parents. So I literally got to be the first black family to move into Harrington Park, New Jersey, because some guy on a couch before I was born decided not just to sit there, but to take an action. And so my social media lives with that purpose. And there are days that, yeah, I do carpool karaoke with friends. 
There are days I make horrible dad jokes. I, I just cannot, I don't have kids that I make dad jokes. I mean, what do you call a guy that makes dad jokes that does not have children? A faux pas. <laughs> so, so I do that in social media because it's a full expression of myself, my authenticity. But my purpose in life is, is one of trying to do everything I can to live the love I hold in my heart. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm gonna, if I can just follow up with that, um, you know, we just saw the, the um, uh, Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, uh, talk about how, and this is with your example about how ceasefire got pulled because yeah. it didn't bring in an audience. And she's talking about basically how Facebook makes its money by appealing to our most base, you know, instincts. Is, are we somewhat uh, responsible for perpetuating that when we use these platforms, even if we're trying to use them for good? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, we are all implicated uh, by the things we take part in if we are taking part in them. Like I, 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 and and it's, it's a hard standard to have, but I don't know where the jeans I'm wearing came from. Did, were they made by child labor? Are there chemicals here that are polluting someone's home? So I, I think it's easy to point fingers at other people. And what I try to do is the first step is I try to think of, to myself. I, I think we all have a responsibility to be more ethically evolved than the society in which we live. To try our best to go a little bit for, it's hard and, 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 and it's difficult, but it, it's led me to Think about the food that I eat. What suffering is involved in that? The clothes I wear, the, what I'm watching. And so, I, yeah, I think that if you're using social media, you should think about what are you participating in? It's not just about what they are doing over there, otherizing somebody else. You have an obligation. And if you accept that obligation, the one thing I will say is, do not allow your inability to do everything to undermine your determination to do something about an injustice, something. Doesn't mean you have to change the world, but make a, a change in your own life that ultimately will affect others. And then the, the other thing I just wanna say is, look, we have a corporate culture in America that is veered wildly away from, from free market ideals. And again, I think capitalism is, I, I'm a capitalist. I think I, 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 you read Adam Smith's moral sentiments, his essays on the moral obligations of capital. And you see these are noble ideals of capitalism. But when our corporate culture becomes as warped as it is now, my, my staff looked at a study of uh, chief operating officers, because now we have this thing called quarterly reporting. Every corporation, because Wall Street's looking at every quarter. And so the question they ask all, all the CEOs is, are you making decisions that are against the in long-term interests of the success of your company to juice up your corporate earnings for that quarterly report? Over 80% said yes. Well, that's a perversion of capitalist ideal. All for what Wall Street is doing these days. Look at the, the food industry. Most people don't know that your, the food you eat is controlled by a a concentrated oligarchy of companies. Most of you probably have heard of the book, uh, Umpton Sinclair, The Jungle. Well, that was talking about what's happened to the court, uh, to the concentration in the meatpacking industry. The meatpacking industry is even more concentrated now in the hands of a few companies. And so I could go on about where capitalism with its high moral ideals is being changed because we have allowed the system to become perverted by short, term interests and Facebook now looking at their quarterly interests and the metrics and they're being measured by, we don't value what, we, what corporations used to value, the communities that they were in. They consider their stakeholders more than their shareholders. And so Facebook seems to be moving its company to try to answer to that drive for quarterly profits. And so if you don't like this, I'm telling you, a different era, a century ago, the progressive era of the 1920s, there were a whole lot of people like us that were speaking out against this kind of corporate culture. And they made a lot of changes in their time, trust busting and um, 
uh, workers' rights, and a lot of things that made capitalism more about the moral ideals. But somehow, in m just my lifetime, 50 years, the, the, the corporations of my dad's era are dramatically different on so many levels. Like a janitor that worked for Xerox, this is a New York Times article, mm -hmm. a janitor that worked for Xerox, first of all, they actually worked for Xerox. They took place in their pension system. The, the, one, the woman they looked at had got to go to school at night because they had a, 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 a system that helped you get an education, pay for your college. And then they, this woman moved up in the company from a janitor moved up to middle management. Well, a janitor that works for Apple doesn't work for Apple. They work for an outsourced company that wins that bid by suppressing wages to poverty wages. So think about, <laughs> to me, again, it's very simple. We are not here because of capitalism as an end. We're not here because of uh, uh, um, a lot of the often short-term thinking. There, sh there has to be a larger moral ideal that is governing our society. If not, then we are just a group of people mindlessly bumping into each other with no real obligation. And to me, that is so contrary to everything you'll read from the Federalist Papers to the Anti-Federalist Papers, where they were arguing about the founding of this country, about what were the highest ideals to help us achieve the best well-being for our citizenry. And I will tell you this one more time. If you look at just the well-being index of Americans today, the anxiety, the stress, the poverty, there's so many indices in which we are have to do a, a self-interrogation to say there's got to be a better way to make this country richer for more. Okay. I want to go back to, you made a reference to um, how your family moved into Harrington Park. And um, the next question from a student is, is kind of in that, in that ballpark. So uh, students in Professor Alvarez's um, race and ethnicity course watched that Netflix series explained and that first episode was about the racial wealth gap. And I yes. think uh, our first question is about that. So if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Aaliyah Moore. Um, Le Leah? Aaliyah. Aaliyah, A-L-I-A? -A? Yeah, A-H, yep. All right. Yep, Fantastic. and I'm a communications major. I'm on the women's soccer team and I'm from Manchester, New Jersey. What position on the soccer team? I'm a forward. You're a forward, all right, fast. Yeah. I mean, I was a keeper. Oh, so I was slow on you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my question is, you said that the American dream isn't real for anyone unless it's within reach of everyone. Can you elaborate more of this and how we can make the American dream a reality from your perspective? And what are some challenges you have faced as an African-American politician trying to make progress on this issue? So two, two points, like I, I, I'm, I've been stunned in my development, especially growing up in one of America's more affluent areas in my area in Bergen County and uh, living in Newark, which is a place where we don't confuse wealth with worth, but there are very low income communities in my city. And you see how tragically different uh, it, just opportunity is for different folks. That there are traps in my community of Newark that folks in my community in Harrington Park or at Stanford or at Yale did not experience. And maybe the best example of this, which is it, it crushes the American dream for millions of people, is just the criminal justice system. I watched from my teenage years all the way through my university years, friends of mine experiment with drugs and have little to no consequence. And then I'll never forget knocking on thousands of doors to run for city council in 1998 and meeting family after family that had their lives and economic fortunes devastated because of convictions for low-level drug crimes. And it's not that far away. Just a few years ago, there were more marijuana arrests in this country than all violent crime arrests combined. So right now we have Americans. And by the way, if you're black, you're four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than you're white, even though there's no differences at all in usage or even in sales. In fact, young white men have a little higher rate of selling drugs than young black men. And so this is, and by the way, once you have that conviction, you can't get a job, you can't get a loan from a bank, talk about student loans. I can go through, in fact, the American Bar Association points to 40,000 collateral consequences if you're an American with a criminal conviction. And that has impoverished entire communities because the war on drugs has been a war on people, not all people, just certain people 
mostly in certain communities. And so that is devastating to this American dream, abjectly unfair. And so where I look at this country, I, I just want to make sure. Now, by the way, it's sapped wealth from all the nation. When you, when you take away people's ability to thrive economically, you, all of us hurt. In fact, just look at infrastructure as I'm battling over infrastructure bills right now. But between the time I was in law school to the time I was uh, um, mayor of the city of Newark, we were building a new prisoner jail every 10 days. That's how much we built out this prison infrastructure to be the number one incarceration uh, uh, nation on the planet Earth with one out of every three incarcerated women in all of humanity is in America. And so that to me is a stunning example how we talk about an American dream, but we rob people of a pathway to it. And I can go through issues of health, environmental injustice, economic injustice and more. And, and so for me, are you driven to do something about this or do you just accept it as part of our culture? Well, for me, I, I, I wanna make sure that the highest ideals of my country are true for everyone. And then as a black politician, look, um, you know, becoming a Senator was, uh, I had one of my stunning experiences when I first walked into the Senate because I'm only the fourth black person in American history to be popularly elected to the United States Senate. And, and so I go to the Senate and it was the least diverse place I had ever worked. And I remember looking at the Judiciary Committee, it took me years to get on it. And I just recently talked to an Asian American who, who, who was affirming what I was saying. <laughs> Uh, who now is working in the private sector, but worked in the judiciary, there, there was no people of color. So the committee in the Senate that most is dealing with the issue I just talked about doesn't have anybody in the room when it's happening, when they're making laws. And I realized that the, the, the self-inflicted wound, because diverse teams, McKinsey will tell you this, Harvard Business School, diverse teams are actually more successful teams. When you bring hidden figures together with white astronauts, you can literally defy gravity as, as that movie Hidden Figures talked about. And so I knew right then that our country was not doing as well as it could be if there were more people with diverse lived experiences, women, people of different religious faiths, all that at the table. And, and so, you know, I, I know there's people in this room, whether you're women, gay, uh, uh, Muslim, when you're the other, you often have to walk in the room and like, okay, is today the day that I have to speak up on behalf of everybody that also is, you know, because you, the, the, you're hearing conversations that, that are not informed by the lived experience that you have. And so, yeah, I, I partnered with another Senator, amazing man named Brian Schatz. We went to Chuck Schumer and said, this is not good. And we forced uh, uh, we didn't force, Chuck Schumer was elated to do anything we could, but we just basically, he made a rule that if you're a Democratic Senator now, you have to publish the diversity statistics of your staff. And guess what happened? Whole lot more women and people of color started getting hired in people's Senate offices because that's accountability. And guess what started happening in my experience was senators started telling me what a difference it made to have diverse voices, black voices, for example, in their office that would speak to policy debates and policy discussions. Some of my bills that are very important to me suddenly got very influential senators to sign on. One of the senators who signed on to a bill I have about studying the issue of reparations said to me, I did it because the black people on my staff really explained the issue to me in a way that moved my heart and I wanna be on your bill. Thank you. Thank you. So our, our next question comes from uh, a student in Professor Alaco's class. I think they watched the uh, documentary Misrepresentation. Oh yeah. That's actually, and I think you were in that as well. So yeah. they saw you in that. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Sophia, go ahead. Uh, introduce yourself first. Hi, my name is Sophia Anuzo. I'm from Monmouth County and I'm a communications major. Monmouth County is like a big place. What town are you oh, from? Wall. Wall. Oh, Wall, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. I always um, think the town of Wall and the town of Brick should just get together. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, we can merge those two towns and call it Brick Wall. 
Okay, I'm sorry. I told you the dad jokes just, I can't stop them. Okay, go ahead. Um, with women becoming more active in politics, has this widened or reshaped your ideas and ideologies? Look, I, I, again, this goes to like often you, when you're another, you feel like you have to uh, sort of often be the person. It's tough, it's tiring to educate others. I mean, I, my whole life experience is, is growing up in a household with a really positive feminist mother. But even so, by the time I was 18 coming to college, I can tell you incredible women in my life that were just always expanding my empathy, making me more aware, making me a better champion of issues of justice as it relates to women and, and others. And I see it in the Senate. Like I, I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee now and there's, there's like 20 guys plus maybe more and only one woman on the committee. So this is the, this is the committee that deals with huge international issues. And there's one woman on that committee, Jean Shaheen. And I tell you, whether she's speaking up for, um, for women in Afghanistan and girls, speaking to issues of healthcare and abortion care, family planning internationally. Yeah, I, 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 my life is made better by, by being around folks, but the solution is not just me becoming a better advocate. Frankly, the solution is why in the United States Senate is only roughly 20% of the Senate women when the United States Senate is when the United States is, is more than 50% women. And we're New Jerseyans, we all vote. You guys know our delegation. I mean, we were pretty much an all male delegation until uh, Mikey Sherrill and Bonnie Watson Coleman uh, uh, just recently joined our very male delegation. And so we have, uh, uh, what, 14 people, including Bob and I, you should, you, I should know yeah. this off the top of my head, but, it, uh, um, but we still have very few women representing the state of New Jersey. I sat down with some Indian, uh, some Taiwanese Americans this weekend from New Jersey, and they're bragging about the fact that their legislature is 40% women, which still to me is not what it ideally should be, but it puts a shadow over, and they have a female leader. So we, we, are, we are, when I sit in committees talking about issues like family planning or abortion, when I sit in committees that are talking about and debating uh, uh, issues of paid family leave or affordable childcare, and it's mostly men who often haven't had, these, haven't had to bear the weight completely of these issues, it's problematic that we don't have more people with lived experience who are actually the decision makers uh, at the table. And by the way, the last thing I'll say to you about women in the Senate, I look at one study that looked at the productivity of senators as measured by bipartisan bills, bills passed, I think a few other measures, not, the, not a perfect measurement system, but they found that the women were more pr productive than the men in the United States Senate. Thank not you. Um, Did you say not surprising? <laughs> no, <laughs> my, my wife would agree. Right? Um, so, and, and for good reason. Um, so uh, our next question, ah, this is a straight up uh, politics question. Sweet, here. okay. Yeah, right, all right. You were talking about the, the infrastructure bills and whatever, so this is from a student in Professor Maynard's introduction to political science class. Ahmad, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Ahmad Brock. Um, What's your first name? Ahmad. Ahmad, as soon as you walked that microphone, I felt, I like felt this kinship because all through college, I wore exactly that, shorts <laughs> and a hoodie the entire time. And like you, I had a lush Afro. Um, so I just feel already, Ahmad, we, we got it going on, all right? <laughs> Where are you from, Ahmad? I'm from Egg Harbor Township. All right. Um, I'm uh, undecided in my major, and um, my question is, how do you deal with the stress of bipartisan gridlock and opposition from Republican colleagues in the Senate? I mean, I, I, I had hair. I don't have it anymore. I, <laughs> I dealt with just pulling out my hair. Um, look, Ahmad, that is, you deal with it by leaning in as much as you can. I deal with it by not demonizing my Republican colleagues. I deal with it by trying to create real relationships with them so that I can get things done. New Jersey did not send me to the Senate to be a great Democratic Senator. They sent me to be a great Senator that delivers for my state. And most of the time I've got to deliver by finding a Republican partner and, and getting things done. And I'm very proud that even though I'm sort of junior in the Senate, uh, that I've gotten a lot of things done for my state and for my nation as a result. 
because of real relationships on the other side of the aisle. And so I think this goes for the United States Senate as well as life. It is so easy just to hang out with people like you, who think like you, who affirm how brilliant your opinions are about the world. But I am telling you that is a shallow life and will limit your ability to create the deeper community that America so, America so urgently needs. And so one of my political heroes, a guy named Bill Bradley, who was a senator when I was coming up, uh, said to me, when you get to the Senate, go out of your way to find connection with Senate. Take them out to dinner. Take them. I asked a lot of my Senate colleagues just to have a meal with me. And I always joke that Ted Cruz and I went out and had dinner together. It took us a long time to, to agree to negotiate a restaurant because I'm a vegan and he's from Texas. Um, but, but one of my favorite stories in the Senate was a guy uh, named uh, Senator uh, Risch, who is, uh, Senator Inhofe, excuse me, who is a senior senator, chairman of the committee, old, older than me. And I, I started going to his office for Bible study. And when I walked into his office, I was thrown because I saw my implicit biases. All of us have implicit biases that my implicit biases were immediately challenged because I got into his office, right-wing conservative, and I see a picture of him in an affectionate embrace with a little black girl. I didn't expect to see that because of my, bias, my natural biases that I need to work on. And I asked him what it was, and it turned out to be his daughter that he adopted out of a very difficult set of circumstances. Now, I can tell you, Inhofe and I have a lot we disagree on from LGBTQ issues all the way to this is a guy who famously brought a snowball onto the Senate floor as evidence that there's no climate change going on. And, but it opened up a, a heart connection between he and I. Um, months and months later, there's a big education bill going through the United States Senate. And there's a guy, very famous senator named Lamar Alexander, who's like managing the bill and no, him and his Democratic partner do not want one amendment on the bill because amendments can make it a bill harder to swallow for the whole Senate. But I'm determined to get a, an amendment on it that would affect homeless children and foster, kids in foster care. And my staff even is with me. They're like, there's no way you're gonna get this amendment on the bill. There's no amendments being allowed. But I remember that, that Senator Inhofe adopted a child out of a difficult circumstance. And I remember going across the aisle, seeing him sort of in the well of the Senate and telling him about it. I had a little card I presented him and I'm still a Senator that I call this more senior Senator's chairman or not by their first name. And I say, you know, chairman, would you? and he goes, I'll look at it. And I, he starts look, reading the card. I explain to him why this is important. And I walk back to my side. By the time I turn around and look at the Senate floor, he's marching over to me, determined. He hands me the card and he goes, I'm in. And he starts walking away and I'm like, what do you mean I'm in? What does that mean? I run after him and go, excuse me, sir, what do you mean? He goes, I'm going to co-sponsor your amendment. The next thing you know, with that momentum, I go to Chuck Grassley, another senior sent. He gets on my amendment. And before you know it, not right now, the law of the land is an amendment I wrote to benefit homeless and foster kids and would not have gotten done if I didn't leave my world of comfort and go sit in Bible study with a right-wing conservative and see his humanity. This is what is so, and God, in this college environment, sit down with somebody of a wildly different view, not to discuss politics. I remember when I was in college, let's get the black fraternities together with the white fraternities and talk about, no, let's get the black fraternities together with the white fraternities and party for a little bit or have some fun and get to see the humanity with each other. That is so important to see first when you see another human being, to see their dignity, to see their humanity, to see their heart and try to build from there. Now, look, as a guy who's been seen racism, not in any way that my parents did, but I've had incidents that happened to me. I'm not saying give license or sanction for someone who is doing things that are directly hurting you. But I just know most of life isn't those dramatic moments. Most of life is every day you passing another human being and the question when you do, or when you have an opportunity to pick the place you sit on an airplane or at a lunch counter or have the possibility of who you choose to talk to in a crowd, are you going to go to those people who make you feel comfortable or will you go across the line that divides you and another person and do the beautiful, I say divine act of finding common humanity? 
that to me will reap blessings, not just to you, uh, but it'll reap blessings that will overflow into the lives of others. Thank you. So <clears throat> you mentioned um, about the staff representation in the Senate. So our next question actually takes that oh, in, a, in, a, in, a different, in a different angle. Uh, that's kind of a practice what you preach a question from a, a student in Professor Danella's uh, Psychology of Women class. All right. Uh, so Sharina, if you can introduce yourself. Hello, Senator. My name is Sharina Ben Cosme. I'm from Prithambo, New Jersey, and um, I'm an English major with a concentration in Is it tough writing. to look at Staten Island all the time there? I mean, so, was it tough? I've lived in Prithambo for 10 years, and I've only been to Staten Island once. I mean, I respect... No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> They, Staten Island is usually coming to us usually. They, you know, the whole yes, show, Jersey some, Shore, was a bunch of Staten Island. Cheaper closer taxes on clothes or something? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right, go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. Um, but my question is um, homophobia is often excused under the justification of religious beliefs. Despite your personal religious beliefs or lack thereof, how do you, as a politician figure, attempt to elevate the voices of women, non binary, and LGBTQ plus individuals within your staff? And also, what steps do you take in your everyday work to include intersectional perspectives that may not be supported by religious in institutions? Wow, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I, I just think that, like, I've learned, you know, there's an old theologian uh, that once said, everywhere I go, I preach the gospel, but only when necessary do I, do I use words. And who you are uh, uh, speaks so loudly, people can't hear what you say. So the question is, the first thing I do is make sure that my office represents the state that I represent. And uh, we are, we've been very conscious of that. I've had three chiefs of staff, I think, maybe four chiefs of staff since I've been United States Senator, and three of them have been women. Um, uh, my state director sitting right here uh, is, is, is a woman. Um, and I don't think that, you know, I think that me as a, as a leader of my office focusing on issues of diversity, whether it's LGBTQ, uh, gender, race, religion, which I think is often uh, uh, people uh, uh, who are differently abled, all of these things are in the consciousness I have of my team building and, and that we think about. Um, then as far as my professional life and, and is, I make sure that diverse groups are always informing the priorities of my office, uh, as well as uh, the issues that we try to champion. And I think in all those areas, um, we do the best we can. My challenge to you, uh, sincerely, is um, I just have found that uh, being is so, sometimes so much better than, than speaking. And as we live in a country that is still so struggling with these issues, um, I hope that you and I both can find ways uh, to help to expand people's consciousness on these issues through our own experiences and willingness to be vulnerable. When I, when I was, uh, and this was interesting, during the presidential campaign, <laughs> Uh, I got miffed, which I always wonder when I get miffed uh, or something triggers me, I always think it's more of a sign of something I've got to work on than the mm -hmm. other person. But I was, it was an LGBTQ forum and the person who was running that forum, I forget which it was CNN, MSNBC, somebody like that, just read an, an essay I wrote for my college newspaper uh, where I wrote this essay about my evolution going from a high school that you know, I went back to my high school now, they have P-flag organizations and they're so, but back when I was going to high school in the 80s, it was a very heteronormative, uh, I would say, uh, homophobic environment. And I had a lot of learning to do on these issues. And I got to Stanford and I started working on a crisis hotline and was stunned about how many calls we would get, suicide calls at times, of people who were struggling coming out. And you sit there and you listen to the raw humanity of someone's struggle, it just so opened up myself up, but it also forced me to confront my, myself. How many times I said, oh, that's so gay, as a pejorative. How many times looking back and seeing now some of my high school friends that were gay, did I not stand up on those issues in a, in a football locker room? And so I wrote a column 
basically calling out a, a what I would call in myself, a, 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 a level of hate. I use the word hate. Maybe it's not the four letter word, but it was a lack of understanding. Anyway, so I'm on the presidential stage in an LGBTQ forum, being one of the champions in the Senate for these issues, like so confident in my recognition and pride that I am an co original co-sponsor of something called the Equal Act to change uh, 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 our civil rights laws to be more inclusive. And the first thing she starts off with is reading just that sentence out of context about me talking about uh, what I thought if I saw it as a 16 year old, two men kissing. Mm -hmm. And I was so offended that she came at me that way, probably didn't read the whole article, but it was an opportunity. And so I think I find in my life whether it's a presidential stage or, uh, or uh, in, in conversations with somebody who just said something that is offensive to me about LGBTQ people. I think that it, it, has, it has helped me, I think, get people to open their eyes more, not just by standing in judgment of them or what they just said, but also opening up a little bit about my own journey and evolution on some of these issues. Because I, I think that when you say things without love and empathy, they're not heard in your heart or spirit. And they often pick people fall into a defensive crouch. And so I would just say, I, we must continue to champion these issues. The number of trans uh, uh, women being killed, especially trans black women, necessitate a fierce uh, um, uh, activism. But again, all of life is not a political stage. It is every single day, the interpersonal actions. And, and if you can be an advocate of loving unconditionally, not condoning, but loving people, or even showing your own vulnerability and your own evolution on issues, I think it helps pull people together and helps you, that message of love and acceptance go further. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're gonna turn, we're gonna turn to some, um issues in the news yeah. today. So Great. The, the first Great. one up is um, about uh, abortion, which is uh, a huge issue today. So go ahead. Um, uh, this is Bianca, right? So yes. introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bianca. I'm a psych major um, from Titton Falls. Um, so basically, as a female student in New Jersey, I'm curious to know how you would balance people's religious views and well, not- I'm not a female student in New Jersey. Well, me, as a as female me student in like, Jersey, as okay, a female, you're asking the question. My, yes, that's okay. my question. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to know how you would balance people's religious views and non-religious views with abortion laws and reproductive rights. What are some of your own personal thoughts on these laws regarding religion and your own personal biases? Oh, I mean, this is so real in my life. We just had a committee in the Judiciary Committee and I, a hearing in the Judiciary Committee on the Texas abortion law. And I have a lot of respect and love for my Republican colleagues. So I still remember when a Senate Republican who I, who I have a lot of love for named Mike Lee, and we've done things together, we've worked on bills together, was speaking. I just wanted to listen to him. Like really, I abjectly disagree. A abortion care is health care. Uh, um, I have these strong beliefs. Every woman should have access to health care. These are the most difficult decisions. They should not be made by government. It should be made by a woman and her provider. I mean, I have very strong cemented beliefs on these issues, but I, I still wanted to listen with love to my colleague and my friend. And it was clear to me that his cemented views come from the fact that he thinks life starts uh, at conception. Now, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, 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 my religious beliefs, I can cite you biblical phrases about you know, when life starts, we have just a different view, but I listen with love. And when it was my turn to speak, I, I, I made my affirmative statements that this law in Texas was not even, an, not even an attack on abortion, it was an attack on low income women, because if you're wealthy in Texas, you're gonna find a way to get an abortion. This was yet another attack on low income women in America. And so I, I, I talked about, made those aff affirming statements about what I believe, but then I said, is there something that we can unite around? And there was a Texas state legislator there. Is there something around this issue that should bring us together on one of the most controversial issues in America? And I expressed my frustration that I still hold that if your goal was to lower the number of unwanted pregnancies, 
Can't we together go to what the facts are of how that has been achieved in this country? Colorado lowered their rates of abortion for young women by 40%. They didn't pass restrictive uh, abortion laws focused on low-income women. What they decided to do was to empower women. And they gave free access to birth control and IUDs to low-income women. There are things we know factually lower the rates of unwanted pregnancies. Free health care, family planning, science-based sex education. Wow, the more people know, here's one that people don't think about, foster care. And, 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 and economically empowering people. I, I went through by myself, looked at a lot of studies of what, what are reasons why women choose to have an abortion. The first answer is none of your damn business, but, but there have been studies that have been done. And one of the biggest reasons I saw often in some studies was number one reason was because of the, the fear of economic poverty. And, and women who choose to have children there's about 400% more likely that they plunge into poverty. And again, that child growing up, poverty is violence. It is a moral obscenity, what we do to young parents. So here are a whole bunch of things we could do. If we had a comment, if we agree, we are not gonna agree on this, let's let it play out politically. Let's, the next Senate election, I hope people think about abortion uh, access to healthcare in that. Let's play it out. Whoever has the most, you know, I, I'm very upset about the anti-democratic reality in our country right now, which. Many of you don't know, but I'm just going to say this as an aside. In the United States Senate, it's 50-50, but the Democrats represent 40 to 50 million more Americans than the Republicans because of a compromise that was done at our founding that gives Wyoming, which I think they have less people than Bergen County does, the same amount of senators, less than a million people, the same amount of senators that California does, 44 million people. So the, so the, the Senate is a very non-democratic place in that sense. The House of Representatives, because of gerrymandering, gets states like Ohio that I think have more Democratic voters than Republican voters in their, in their House elections, but their House delegation is bigger Republican. So that's because of gerrymandering, which is an anti-Democratic thing. The presidency, I don't know if you all have heard of this, I'm saying that jokingly, but the Electoral College has allowed most of the last Republican presidents since I was of voting age be elected in this country without a majority of votes. The majority of people voted against them. And that, those two branches of government have now made the Supreme Court, who's making decisions on abortion, be a body that's anti-democratic too. The majority of the Supreme Court now has been nominated by a president who didn't win majorities, confirmed by a Senate where the minority representatives confirmed that senator. So to tell me the majority is, this is a democracy where the majority are controlling these institutions is just factually not true. But that shouldn't turn you to cynicism. You shouldn't surrender to cynicism with that. If that was the case, if our ancestors did, we wouldn't have civil rights <laughs> because people who didn't have voting rights fought for voting rights and got them, suffrage movement, so on and so forth. That should get you to lean in more. But as you fiercely talk about the issue of, of, of defending a woman's healthcare rights, I, I also think part of the conversation should be also, what can we be doing to still try to affirm our, our common aspirations. You may be a conservative, religious conservative who, who believes what I believe in is killing you know, a, a, a life. I may firmly believe you are putting women's health at, at horrible risks and sending us back to a time when women were dying because of lack of access to abortion care. But amidst that debate, can we articulate some common ground? You believe, according to your faith, in loving children. Can we then at least agree that we're going to create a system that any child anywhere born is going to have an economic floor, that they're not living in the violence of poverty? Can we agree that uh, low-income women should have access to prenatal care and family planning? Is there some way to get people that you disagree with on a common page so that we can advance uh, um, uh, the issue of, of, of healthcare in this country. So.
Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Another hot topic or uh, controversial topic is certainly an important one. Uh, Can't today. you take some of the hard questions? I mean, no, I mean that's, that's off the hook here, yeah. right? But uh, teaching critical race theory. Oh, all right. So there's a question um, here from Kaylee here. So if you introduce yourself, Kaylee. Hi, I'm Kaylee. I'm a comp sci major and I'm from Monroe Township. You're from where? Monroe. Monroe. So my question is, as we all know, the history that is being taught within school systems is now up for interpretation among many other states. How do you feel about school systems refusing to teach black history to their students? And if you oppose this filtered and whitewashed version of history, are you looking to implement more into the school system about not only black history, but also expanding the horizons and to talk about intersectionality and what it means to be a person of color in these times? You're really picking the easy topics here. But <laughs> look, I, I think what's happening is just awful that some graduate level course of critical race theory has now been co-opted by people to say that we're teaching grade school curriculums that I, I, I have not seen grade school curriculums uh, uh, that reflect the graduate studies of critical race theory. What I see is grade school curriculums, high school curriculums, trying to teach a full view of American history. And, and, and to try to, as you said, uh, uh, whitewash out all of the, um, all of the uh, uh, bigotry and hate that has been a part of the American story, whether it's towards women, towards Native Americans, towards, uh, I mean, the hatred even that waves of immigrants from Europe faced in this country. Um, we are a country that some people seem to think that giving a Disneyland version of American history will, will make us a greater country. I think it makes us a lesser country. I think when you talk about the wretchedness and the pain and the hurt and the struggle and, and then say how far we've come, that makes us an even greater nation and it makes us a nation that is, is telling its truth in a way that will continue to propel it forward to more healing and more justice. And so I, I, I don't know what to do. We, we have a nation that believes in the, um, that, that these aren't federal decisions on, on curriculum, they're local decisions, right? And these are having to be played out. And I just worry, but yet I feel some confidence. So I worry because um, when, young, and I talked to a friend of mine who's a college professor who, who just was surprised that a lot of her college students just, weren't aware of the levels of massacres we've had in this country, uh, the levels of violence against Native Americans, Black folks, um, the, I mean, I mean, I mean this, the massive rallies we've had in Madison Square Garden, the Nazi party, how big it was, how real it was. You know, I think that that's um, really unfortunate that we are, have students that just don't understand that those complexities within our history and it makes it very hard for them to project forward. I have confidence though, because again, in my 50 years of life, I have just seen a lot more understanding. When I saw during, in the aftermath of George Floyd, the, the top uh, uh, sort of books being read on Amazon's bestseller list, um, on a New York Times bestseller list, were all books about uh, racial injustice and racial understanding. Um, I, I, it just makes me feel hopeful. I think we are, despite the backlash we're seeing right now, which should be spoken to, which should be called out, which should engage us more in our local school boards, which demands action and a response. But at the end of the day, I, I do feel in this sense that the arc of the moral universe, as King would say, is long, but it does bend towards justice and understanding. That said, we all have to take responsibility also for being arc vendors. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so our next uh, question is, you talked a lot about one of the policy areas that you focused on in your environmental, uh, in your presidential run was environmental justice. Yes. So we, have a, we have a question from Ariel on that. Hi, I'm Ariel. Um, I'm a chemistry major here at Monmouth and I'm from Long Island, New York. Now, Ariel, you're like a different generation than me, clearly. Um, but when I was growing up, like Ariel was the Little Mermaid, and, and you know, do you get people that break out in song? Like, yes, you know, sometimes. But um, like where I'm from, Ariel's a boy's name, 
So I even get a lot of like weird looks, like at least in the Hispanic community, like you already have a boy's name more than I do like the mermaid. Okay. okay. <laughs> so it's either or. It's either or. Okay. Well, yeah. I my staff literally the reason why Hannah's sitting up front is to rush up to me and take my microphone if I start singing, but I really do. <laughs> in, if you could get in my head right now, you would hear a great version of- Under the Sea? Of, of, yes, Under the Sea. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, well, last year, Governor Murphy passed the Environmental Justice Bill. Uh, the bill focuses on many different sources of pollutants present in overburdened communities. I work in a research lab that focuses on water quality data, which doesn't seem to be a topic highlighted in the bill. So my question is, why was water quality not a prominent topic addressed? Are there any plans on combating water pollution in New Jersey in the near future? Yeah, I, so first of all, Governor Murphy has, uh, to me, been one of the greatest champions for environmental justice our state has seen in my lifetime. And uh, he's somebody I know personally, and you know, most people don't realize this, New Jersey has the most Superfund sites of any state. Uh, it is, uh, has serious water quality issues from the lead in the water of many New Jerseyans, all the way to some of the most polluted rivers in America. The Passaic River, for example, is a, is a great example of that. And so to have a governor that is not only willing to talk about these issues and focus on them, but get legislation passed and, frankly, uh, invest resources. We have a resource-strapped state, but he's willing to invest state resources in, in addressing these issues. It's just a huge success. And that's why when I see him, I think he's tired of it, but I always hug him. Um, so, so, and I was very proud that I, I was one of the founders of the Environmental Justice Caucus in Washington, wrote an environmental justice comprehensive bill along with environmental justice advocates from our state and around, and, and was able to then go back and work with the state in getting their own EJ bill passed. And so I, I know that there's water quality issues that are not in that bill. That said, the state, and I worked with the state to free up millions of dollars to address lead problems in our state. And now, and I talked to President Biden two weeks ago in the Oval Office, fighting to keep and maintain uh, his uh, water quality elements in that bill. Like again, getting more lead pipes out of the ground and having more money to invest in environmental justice. He sees that, the president sees that as a, as a critical uh, issue that he wants to try to hold on to in reconciliation. The last thing I'll say about this is, um, if you put race over the lens of environmental injustice, it's stunning. The number one indicator, whether you as an American will live around a toxic environment where you're drinking dirty water, breathing dirty air, have dirty soil under your feet so you can't plant your tomato uh, plant, is, it, it is the color of your skin. Um, and I think we all uh, uh, need to face an urgency. I grew up in Harrington Park, incredible, woods around me, all of that. When I moved to Newark, when I became mayor, we were the most underparked city in America and had four times the asthma rates of surrounding communities. Also because those surrounding communities would push public um, uh, things into Newark. So whether it's Newark to New Haven have highways that would just tore up entire communities to go right through. So you have all these highways, you have the port right there in Newark, the airport, you have the county incinerator in there. All of these air quality issues uh, that drive up asthma rates because a lot of things are concentrated in our low income cities and not in our suburban areas. That is a issue all of us should be taking more responsibility for. And the last thing I'll say, because the one committee I moved to that people sometimes look at me and say, why are you on that committee? Is I moved to the Ag Committee. And I moved to the Agriculture Committee because that issue sits at the center of all these issues I care about. Uh, from economic justice to environmental justice. Uh, I care about what happens to animals and what we do to animals now in our perverted, not like our grandparents raised livestock in this country. It's these perverse, massive feeding operations that pack people in. Our species is at risk because when you pack animals into that, they get sick really easily. So they overuse antibiotics. And now we're creating breeding grounds for antibio antibiotic resistant strains that could kill massive amounts of humanity. Uh, but, but the one thing on water quality that I want you to know, and I went down there and literally wept, got emotional the first time I saw it, because we, again, it's about not knowing the systems you're participating in and the injustice that it causes. So we raise pigs in, in, in unconscionable ways in this country. Uh, and you have these places that 
where they pack the pigs into these massive warehouses, all covered in these horrific environments. The pigs produce about nine times the feces of humans, and it all goes through these grates, pours into these massive lagoons of feces. And then they take it and try to dispose of it by putting it on spray fields. And I stood there and watched how they spray, and just like your sprinkler that you used to play in as young people, if you were like me, it mists. And that is a low, in, in Duplin County, North Carolina, it's a low income African-American community. And when I met with these, the stench, I, I will not forget. And when you meet with these people, all for our low cost, cheap bacon, they can't open their windows. They can't run their air conditioning. They can't put their clothing on their lines. They have high rates of respiratory diseases. And so this one guy with his veteran's hat, uh, Vietnam veteran saying, I, I went and fought for my country and I came back home and I'm a prisoner in my own community. They can't sell their land. And when storms come through, which are coming through more often, what happens in those lagoons? All that crap is lifted out of the lagoons, polluting river strakes and lean, uh, rivers, lakes, and streams. When I was in the Midwest, I still remember white farmer telling me, he used to be able to fish out of his creek and drink the well, water from his well. Since the CAFO moved in, uh, close to him. He can't do either anymore. So we are all have a nation now that has a, an agricultural system that because of the way people are being forced to raise livestock because of these monopolistic companies and these poor contract farmers, by the way, they live in, in sub uh, like sharecroppers, the people that are forced to raise the pigs like this. But we're living in a food system now that is causing the eco ecological uh, devastation uh, uh, and perpetuating it, including the number one reason for rainforest destruction now is for uh, the animal agriculture, whether it's to grow the commodity crops that feed them or for grazing land. The, the, the system that we are in, the standard American diet, sad, uh, is driving so much environmental injustice as well when it doesn't have to be that way. We can have regenerative farming systems more like we used to, where farmers are not contributing to the problems of climate change, being forced to raise livestock in this way, but are actually doing things in a way that sequester carbon and actually help us to lead out of the, uh, of the climate crisis that we have. Great. We're running Thank up you. against our time, so we're gonna squeeze in one last question One, I was hoping for two. I, oh, yeah. I, I could be a little late, Anna, can yeah. I? Yeah, no? some, some of the, yeah, she's saying them, right? Um, so uh, Monmouth is, is justly proud. Um, it's rated as one of the top schools in the Northeast to support veterans who are pursuing their college degrees. So our next question is coming from someone who has a student who served. I don't know uh, what she country. said, but people are walking out on her right yeah, they, now. They, 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 some of them have their, their next class. I know, I'm just joking. Yet, right? um, who starts at, uh, she served our country in the U.S. Coast Guard. And oh. I think you're still in... Um, Reserve, yes, reserve sir. service, yes, there, right? So um, our next question is from Nicole. Uh, so my name's Nicole. Uh, I'm from South Plainfield. Um, You're I'm from where? South Plainfield. Oh, right, South Plainfield. I'm a communications major. So uh, my questions, one often underrepresented group is female veterans. Most of this, I believe, is due to the lack of exposure in the media, which often makes many women service members feel less accepted in society than their male counterparts. In a survey, roughly 74% of women felt unrecognized for their military service. They also face a wide range of discrimination in organizations with 14% feeling unsafe seeking VA medical treatment. Suicide and homelessness rates are also exponentially high. What changes, if any, do you see moving forward to tackle these kinds of issues for this group of women? I mean, thank you very much. I have to be candid with you. Before I became your senator, I was not aware of these issues. I was sort of stunned when I was married to the city of Newark about how so many of our veterans were struggling with issues that spoke more towards the lack of empathy and compassion from our society. And so we created the first ever municipal one-stop center. Any veteran in Newark could walk in and we would have an array of services as opposed to them having to navigate sort of Byzantine labyrinth of, of, of services, we tried to concentrate it all and really become a city hall focused on our veterans. But it wasn't until I was a new senator that I went and my team set up a meeting with me and female veterans from New Jersey that I started hearing stories that were so objectionable and, and offensive. And um, just the fact of getting healthcare, 
uh, the VA, the wait to, for gynecological care was extraordinarily long because we just lacked the doctors in our, through our VA system. And so my team has taken on this as an issue uh, and we've been pressing and, and thankfully uh, getting significant change, including a, a, a CBOC, a community-based outpatient clinic that we just helped open in Southern New Jersey that has an array of healthcare services for our, our female vets that they have earned and deserve. Uh, but even more than this, we have a lot of uh, other issues that we just need to talk about from uh, trauma-informed care, because a lot of our, uh, uh, our military is still grappling with sexual assault and those, those kind of issues, all the way to the challenges, economic challenges female veterans face uh, uh, raising children and getting back into the workforce. So we are championing a lot from um, support for uh, veteran entrepreneurs, to support for veteran healthcare, childcare, and more. And I'm really proud, uh, again, having only been your center for eight years, but from Sussex County to uh, Cape May County, we've been able to make a lot of uh, a real measurable strides for serving our veterans here in the state. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I wanna thank you, Senator. There's a lot more questions there. And so maybe afterwards, if you still have your question that you can take a little bit of time. I, I just wanna thank you, you are, you're, in, you're often not appreciated at home, but you are a national uh, figure who is really respected uh, throughout the country for the work that you do. And I just wanna say thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us. And thank you all of you who are watching at home. Thank Thanks. you everyone. Thank you.